everyone, this is Toby from the International Association for Political Science Students. We are here again live from San Francisco at the annual convention of the International Studies Association. And with me, with me here today is Peter Katzenstein, and I'm very glad that you're with us today. Thank you. Um, my first question, and we directly jump into the topic of our um, discussion today, civilization in world politics. Um, in the book from 2010, you and your colleagues describe different cultural words um, rather than worlds, rather than differentiating between security or economic blocks or regional um, entities. Why did you decide for this approach and um, can you describe how it actually works out? So a colleague of mine, Sam Huntington, wrote a book wrote an article in 1993 uh, about the clash of civilization. And when I read that piece, I knew it was wrong. And I was doing a research project on uh, security, which came out in 1996, the culture of national security. And when you look at the conclusion, there are a few pages about hunting and why he's wrong. But then I was working a lot on regionalism for about a decade. And uh, I never got around to elaborate why I thought he was wrong. And when, when the regional work was over, I was sort of looking around, I said, this is, worth, this is a topic worth exploring. So it was sort of a delayed reaction, right? Uh, at the same time, I knew that while well, the regional work was read in America, that the civilizational work would not be read in America. It was an unpopular topic, right? But it's a popular topic in other parts of the world, so I said, what the hell? And it started off, I wrote a, a summary paper, maybe 15 pages, and said, I'd like to explore this in a round table at the American Political Science Association, I think. Maybe it was the ISA, I can't remember. And I invited people who were senior colleagues. I mean, this was a collaborative uh, project, you know, and, uh, and they responded very, they were very engaged unusually so uh, in responding to that memo and uh, I said you know I want everybody to write five to ten pages you know and then I said I think this will work as a book and uh, that was the first volume and then I said well it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities I will do two more books uh, one on the East and one on the West one on sinicization, and one on Anglo-America. And so it became a trilogy. But it wasn't clear to me it would be a trilogy when I started off. So why exactly was Huntington wrong? What, what was what bothered you the most? Because he essentializes actors. Uh, so the, the really good book about, the really good thing about the book is that Huntington doesn't fool his audience. Uh, he tells his audience from the first to the last page, I'm writing this book in order to change your, the way you look at the world because the Cold War is over. Uh, so he's not underhanded at all. Uh, but if you look at the map of civilizations, you know, and this is a complicated subject, but all, of his, all the maps are always monochrome. You know, one color for the Muslim world, one for the... Chinese world, one for the European, Western, or Atlantic world, right? And, you know, you're living in the United States. All you know is there's a lot of disagreement. You talk to anybody in any country, you know, there's a lot of disagreement. So his conception of civilization as the crystallization of values, which is a consensus view of politics, is antithetical to every empirical evidence which I see. So if you say that group cohesion is created by disagreement, not by agreement, you get much further. And so it's really the, the essentializing move of saying there are these unities, in this case very large unities, civilizational spaces. Right? And he doesn't sustain the argument. I mean, uh, um, he writes about civilizations in the first two chapters. After that, it's big states. Right? So for him, civilizations act, they have agency. And I think that's wrong. Civilizations are 
complex systems in which actors operate. Right? So it's a, just a totally different company. Saying this and being so critical of him, I dedicated the second volume to him because I think it's a, a wonderful book uh, to engage you intellectually. But it is wonderfully wrong-headed. Um, you were pointing out that um, there's, there's a notion when it comes to the interpretation of civilizations, um, whether we're talking about people disagreeing or agreeing with each other. Would you also say that this is connected to an optimist and a pessimist view on civilizations and politics? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, Huntington was a realist who recognized cultural varieties in world politics. And he says, we are taking ourselves too seriously, we the United States, and saying, we are the world. We are not the world. We are part of the world, and there are other parts of the world, and they have just as much claim to be respected as we are. In that sense, he was very much like Spengler, okay, who developed this decline of the West theory, which is quite Huntingtonian, or Huntingtonian is quite like Spengler uh, in 1917. Um, uh, so I think the optimism and pessimism there, I think Huntington writes against the arrogance of the liberals who say, his colleagues and friends, you know, who say the world will, the liberalism will remake the world. And he says, no, it won't. So I started the project in which I was very anti-Huntingtonian. I ended the project being very anti-liberal. Uh, that, that critique of liberalism is correct. And we are now seeing that people worrying about the end of the liberal order, I mean, whatever that means, you know, uh, that's actually what Huntington told them 20 years ago. Um, you were talking about people being afraid of the end of the liberal order. Do you think there is something like the liberal order? Do you, do you agree with this notion and the concept? No, I don't. Uh, so the third volume, which is on Anglo-America, you know, one of the arguments is that there are many liberal orders. So take the one which we like. Uh, multiculturalism, complex sovereignties, uh, the kind of global order which has emerged in our self-understanding, the liberal self-understanding of the last generation. Well, you go a hundred years back, you know, liberal, the liberal order was imperialist and racist. And uh, so the core value of liberalism in that international order has been totally remade. How did it, was it remade? By politics, through political conflict. Uh, so they, there is no one international liberal order. There never has been. There never will be. I mean, it seems to me a conceit to think, to think that. And take John Eikenberry, you know, who writes a lot about liberal international order. I've stopped counting, but I think under his, in his scholarship, there are already three since 1945. Right? Um, in your work, you're um, pointing upon plural and pluralist uh, civilizations in contrast to that. Can you give us an idea of what that means? Well, a world of plural civilizations is the one which Huntington saw. There are, you know, whether, how many there are, are there six, are there 34, nobody knows. And I, I say are there six or 34 because the great, great unknown is Africa. Africa has many civilizations uh, and our modern Africanists not do not recognize that category. They think in terms of nation states or tribal affiliations. But in terms of civilizational language, there are many more civilizations in Africa than there in the rest of the world, probably. Uh, so Africa is a great unknown for civilizational analysis. Um, but that, Huntington recognized that. And the Chinese, for example, Chinese students or Chinese scholars resonate deeply with the concept because they say we are a civilizational state. Many people in India say that. Uh, this is certainly what the Eurasian worldview of uh, Putin, okay? He says this is a civilizational thing which is different from the, the Atlantic world, right? Um, so that is the plural part. The liberals insist on the pluralist part, that if you look inside lips, these uh, civilizations, there's a lot of pluralism. And that strikes me as utterly correct. And Huntington didn't see it because he essentializes this. You know? So in some ways you could say that 
take liberalism and, and cultural realism together, take the relevant parts of them, put them together, you got a better view than either of the other one. And that's basically what the trilogy does. Before um, raising my next question, I also want to encourage you at home um, to, of course, um, write your questions as always down in the comment bar. Um, if you have any, um, we would like to discuss those as well. Um, coming back to our topic, I, I feel so you are, um, you're uh, moving away or have moved away from, from the mainstream of IR that um, mainly analyzes states, nation states as units, for example, that um, has this positivist um, <laughs> assumptions. Can you give our uh, followers an idea of how exactly do you, do you start a research project when you, when you think about these very um, abstract um, forms of politics that may not seem that obvious on the first view? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. I mean, it's a very good question, but it points to the limits of teaching. Uh, um, Michael Oakeshott, you know, British philosopher, you know, conservative political theorist. You know, some, so I say, how do you train somebody to become a cook? Uh, I just don't have them read cookbooks. They should become an apprentice to a cook, right? I mean, it's... We can teach approaches, we can teach methods, we can teach how do you get started. But I think, you know, looking at how people do their work, I think there are two ways of getting started. And both of them are totally legitimate and right. You have just to figure out who you are and how you tick and how you engage. So one would be something interests you in the world. There's something odd going on, okay? Uh, and you're saying, I got to figure this out. So the world will then lead you to approaches or theories or methods or whatever. And the other one says, there's an idea. And I think it's a wrong headed idea. The way I thought that the hunting Arctic from 93 was wrong. Uh, and then you go towards the world. And it really doesn't matter where you start. What does matter in the end is that you bring those two things together, the world of facts and the amazing world we live in and watch, and the world of theories and ideas with which we try to comprehend it. Right. The starting point doesn't really matter. Do you feel um, working on these issues, I know that you have also been um, practically engaged a lot, for example, with the um, Council of Foreign Relations. Um, do you feel when you give um, policy advice, for example, that um, a lot of um, politicians or NGOs, IGOs um, are trained to um, want to listen to um, numbers and data, um, uh, kind of empirical material that has, has been produced through um, positivist assumptions rather than um, post-structural analysis or critical analysis. Well, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but I don't give policy advice. Uh, and nobody's ever asked me. I once, I think I once testified in front of Congress, 1980. Uh, and it was, you know, the, the congressional session was over and it was something about industrial policy. And it was an interesting experience, but it didn't matter, right? Does the, I mean, I rather believe in uh, uh, policy advice as being in a circle of knowledge, this is a model from Merton from the 1950s. If you think about the outer circle uh, of basic knowledge being developed in the universities, and the innermost circle being the executive summary memo, which a staff member writes for a highly placed policymaker. So those are the, the outer and the inner circle. The inner circle is related to the outer circle through a variety of intermediaries, right? Uh, in the United States, typically policy relevant institutes where the researchers are in touch with the scholarship, they follow the scholarship and they try to pick up on new findings or approaches, and they're attentive to their audience, which is in the policy world, they translate it. And then in the policy world, they take those reports and they compress them. 
So there are probably four or five intermediary stages. Uh, once you're a friend of mine, Steve Krasner, he was in the policy world, he was head of policy planning. Once you're in the policy world itself, you don't have any time to think. That's, he says, you only use the stock of knowledge which you bring to the policy world. So if you have quite a lot of knowledge, you can be very effective. Joe Nye, Strobe Talbot, they have a lot of knowledge. Uh, they came last in the policy world quite a lot because they know a lot. Uh, if you know very little, you're probably not very effective. The current president of the United States knows very little. He's not very effective, right? Uh, but, but the grind of the business, the daily business, is such that you do not have time to think. So I'd rather think of it you know, as preparing packages and handing them over. And in the outer world, the, the outer ring of basic knowledge, you know that you will be read by somebody and some of those things will filter through, but you don't know how. Do you then think that more politicians or uh, activists should be more trained with political science, through political science or social sciences? I think that depends on the, where they're situated. I mean, in some areas of policy, understanding the science is very important. I mean, environment, for example, right? And the other ones, incarceration, the science is not relevant. Morality is relevant, right? So uh, I think there's no general answer to that. Uh, I don't think politicians, politicians need to be schooled in how to, how to handle power. And that, that's, what, that's what they are. That's the animal. Uh, they don't have to be demographers to come up with a good public health policy. Uh, any good politician will always ask his policy staff, they recommend him back this legislation or that. The merits of the policy are important, but they are not decisive. What is decisive for a politician is whether whatever choice he or she makes at a given point will narrow or broaden this choice set down the road. And a good politician will always want to have more choices down the road than less. That's a skill and it's a practice. And that is what a good politician learns. Uh, a good politician does not become a good technocrat. That would, be, that would not be his calling or her calling. Right. Um, let's talk a bit about um, what does it take to become a good um, political scientist. And uh, this, this may be my, uh, my closing question as well. I want to draw back um, to what you said in the, in the beginning about how you get to an idea and you said, um, there might be always something that troubles you that you're not agreeing with where you feel that that there needs to be a change um, how how was it for you because the things we we're talking about uh, um, have mainly been topics that were um, uh, following you throughout the career the, the ideas or the um, the general the general mindset let's say um, do you feel that, um, was there something that, that really bothered you, and particularly looking at the fact that, um, especially in the last three years, four years, um, all over the world, there are tensions that create more, try to create more distance between um, um, imagined communities, between um, also religions, different communities? I think what bothers me is the universal tendency to simplify. You know, we are now in a, in a world where most of the time you say what you want to say in 142 characters. And given the richness of life and the complexity of life, that, that degree of compression and reduction, you know, where, I mean, whether it is on the media or in the classroom or whatever, you know, there is not enough, not enough urge to think, to think the world afresh. Uh, I think that's been my, uh, I think the motivation for me to become a teacher and a scholar, the luxury and the importance of rethinking the world. Uh, that's what we do in a classroom. That's what we do through research, right? Uh, and I think that's a, it's a, it's a different. Um, motivating force than 
something which happens in world politics at a particular stage. There are always bad things happening in world politics, right? And for some people, you know, if, if you're driven to activism, that is what draws you into the world. And then you say, well, in order to deal with the world, I've got to know something about how to do this, right? And then you go and study. Uh, for me, this wellspring was the urge to, to not go too quickly to the compression and the simplification with which we basically think to think the world. Peter Kassenstein, I want to thank you a lot for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.